Hello class, it's uh, me again, John Duncan, your professor. Uh, I'm sitting in my office and, uh, you know, like I said earlier, these are fairly casual lectures. They're not formal in any way. I'm not going to a studio and uh, presenting any information. I'm just sitting at my chair in my, in my office and we'll keep these fairly short and uh, just conversational. I'm uh, trying basically to uh, come up with some ideas, some lecture ideas that will help you uh, cover some of this material. And today um, I will probably do a series of these because I can only do about five minutes per lecture, so I'll probably do one or two on psychostimulants. Uh, psychostimulants are drugs that actually stimulate the brain in many different ways, mostly by causing uh, an activation of the dopamine uh, system itself. Uh, every drug of addiction causes dopamine to be released. So if you took heroin, which is not a stimulant, uh, it has a peripheral dopamine effect. Stimulants uh, actually cause dopamine to be released. They also cause a tremendous amount of norepinephrine, which is a stimulation, focus, action, uh, energizing brain chemical to be released as well. Uh, these, these things uh, mostly are cocaine and the amphetamine family, uh, methamphetamine being one type of amphetamine, uh, methylphenidates, Ritalin uh, uh, being another, uh, straight amphetamine, and other variants of, of those phenylethylamines is what they call them. Uh, so those types of drugs uh, tend to be stimulants. We most often uh, see methamphetamine being abused here in the United States also in the Orient uh, and uh, South America. This is, a, this is a major drug of abuse. So uh, today what I will do is discuss, let me get this camera set just a little better so that you're not looking at part of my face. Um, today I'll discuss uh, methamphetamine for you. Uh, first of all, if someone does a shot of methamphetamine, intravenous injection of methamphetamine, or if they smoke it, it gets in the system faster than if they eat it. Uh, but if they do that, uh, all of a sudden, 100% of the pleasure chemistry in the brain just goes kaboom and completely is released in one instant. The, there's nothing else that does this. Uh, no food or anything else. Remember, too, that dopamine and, and norepinephrine are survival related uh, for the brain. So the brain is basically uh, being calibrated by this release and uh, it's training the brain that this is a survival behavior on a very primitive brain level. The other thing though is that you feel really good. I mean you have all this energy, you have all this reward, this is a wonderful thing that's happening to you if you're on methamphetamine, at least that's what you experience. Now what it's really doing is destroying your brain health and your physical health after a while. Uh, but you get a surge, you start having rapid heartbeats, you feel a tremendous amount of energy, you feel all of these kinds of things going on, and then uh, if that, uh, the dopamine has a receptor molecule and has, then the dopamine actually hits the receptor molecule and stays in that, in that uh, uh, position, uh, activated position, until it causes an effect. Well, uh, if if these receptor molecules are always filled, it causes something else to happen. A G protein binds on the receptor side and goes down to the nucleus of the cell and causes two things to happen. The first one being we want more receptor cells here, so it overpopulates the D2 receptor. The second thing that happens uh, is that it causes uh, a genetic transcript to awaken that comes out uh, it's called Cocaine Amphetamine Regulated Transcript, or CART. You can see Stephen Stahl's book on essential psychopharmacology for a nice little discussion of that. Uh, but uh, Cocaine Amphetamine Regulated Transcript causes the death of the tendrils or dendrites that go from this particular cell to other cells that don't have maybe anything to do with the dopamine stimulation process. Uh, so different parts of the brain begin to act differently. They, they act independently. Uh, one, the amygdala, which is the part of the brain that you know is associated with hypervigilance and awareness of our environment and tells us if there's anything dangerous uh, going on. 
uh, that doesn't talk to the thalamus anymore, which is where it gets its information from about the world, the sensory center. It doesn't talk as well to the thalamus, and it doesn't communicate as well to the higher parts of the brain that are able to uh, be able to control it. So the amygdala basically then uh, becomes disorchestrated uh, with other parts of the brain, and it thinks or it leads you to believe on a very primitive brain level that something's wrong in the environment and so you get paranoid this is the biological onset of paranoia uh, we see more and more modules of the brain becoming disconnected one of the first things that uh, really happens is the blood flow to the because you're in a kind of a crisis mode here the blood flow to the prefrontal area which is the higher order brain function right in here that part of the brain is diminished and you can see on some of the brain scans that, uh, that there's not much going on in the prefrontal area. Well, that's the part that lives our life for us. That's the part that controls our inhibition. It's the part that um, enables us to set goals and, and, and live a purposeful life. That becomes less involved here. Uh, further, uh, the basal ganglia, which is in the limbic part of the brain, is the driving force, the anxiety level of the brain. That's mainly controlled by norepinephrine and uh, that's on full speed so your anxiety level goes up really high your paranoia level goes up high you can't make sense of things you can't set goals as well uh, so we see the brain changing causing life to change on the other side uh, psychosimulants such as cocaine and meth do this now cocaine uh, unlike meth if you're on methamphetamine you can go up for a long time and meth sort of looks like dopamine so it keeps you going for a while and then eventually you'll crash but you can do meth several times and still stay high for maybe even a week. With cocaine, you go up and you go down, up and down, up and down, up and down in a more cyclical pattern. Uh, so you get uh, a lot more cravings, up and down cravings when you're on cocaine. Uh, but at the same time, you're not having as sustained of a brain damage pattern. So you're not up there with the dopamine in the synapse uh, for grand lengths of time. It's just intermittent. But it, it is also cumulative, so you have the same sort of brain damage coming from uh, cocaine misuse. Uh, anyway, these are a few things. I'm trying to make this video just a little longer and see if it works, so hopefully it will. Uh, but these are a few things that, uh, that are caused uh, uh, with the brain uh, that are caused by uh, stimulants, psychostimulants. Uh, the end product of chronic psychostimulant use is more and more brain disorchestration. Different parts begin to not work together. Uh, the part that knows uh, it's me, for example, is in the Brodmann's area 10 uh, at, the pre at the bottom of the prefrontal area. The part that uh, processes language or linguistic thought is on the side in the temporal lobes mostly. So if the temporal lobes no longer are communicating effectively with the part that knows it's me, then my own linguistic thought becomes an alien voice in my consciousness. I start hearing voices that are not mine. I don't believe they're mine. Actually, they're my own brain processing linguistic thought. Uh, so uh, as the brain becomes more disoriented, things like seeing false images, uh, basically it's my own kinesthetic awareness, uh, but that part of the brain that processes that is not connected as well to the part that knows it's me, so I believe it's someone outside of me. Uh, it can be in my own uh, uh, conscious uh, life world. It doesn't have to be right here with me. It can be over there. Uh, so these are some things. Basically, what you're seeing is that psychostimulant abuse uh, gradually makes someone more and more like a paranoid schizophrenic. And much of this brain damage is irreversible, although some of it when you stop doing the drugs, of course, the brain damage stops, and some of it is recoverable. Functional damage is more recoverable. Structural damage is less recoverable. Uh, probably the most brain recovery will happen over a four-year period. After that, it's going to be marginal, if at all. Uh, anyway, I'm going to close this video for now. I'll be sending you more later, uh, just as I think of things to talk to you about. Uh, but like I said, I keep them fairly casual, and I hope you enjoy these and hope you get something out of that that goes along with some of the PowerPoint shows and other things that you're doing. Uh, also, if you want to discuss anything, certainly uh, hit the discussion board, questions for the professor, uh, post it where everyone can see it so that we can all participate in that. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a nice weekend. Bye-bye.